Now this video has been long in the making. Since April I've been working what was intended to be a 10 minute long video trying to debunk the most basic of conspiracy theories to help steer the lost and gullible onto the right path. However, the script for the video ended up longer than your average undergraduate dissertation and went from tackling basic conspiracies to an in-depth look at the more complex ones. As such, I've decided to split the script into specific videos to help organise the content and make more easily producible videos. The first video is aimed at tackling the Children's Health Offence, an initially noble-sounding non-profit organisation that upon further investigation is dangerous, misleading and agenda-ridden. The Children's Health Defense was founded by Robert F. Kennedy Jr., obviously the nephew of JFK. At face value, this may appear to give a degree of reliability to the CHD, which is something we will get into later on, but upon further investigation, it's really just an appeal to authority. His elevated status is irrelevant here. The CHD argues that the noticeable increase in diagnoses of autism, ADHD, autoimmune diseases, food allergies and cancers can be directly linked to vaccines, pesticides, water fluoridation and wireless communications. Unlike many other anti-vaccine and anti-establishment quacks and grifters that look to spout the trending flavour of bullshit for monetary gain, the CHD appears to have a scientific basis for what they say. Unfortunately, this means the CHD are one of the major contributors to vaccine misinformation online, a growing trend that will affect lives. On social media, it is easier than ever to appear reliable, and the fact many people already have understandable fears that can be easily preyed on, or you find people with biases who are simply looking for content to reaffirm their beliefs, means misinformation spreads like wildfire. So today I'm going to look at some of their claims, some of the people running this organisation, contextualise some of what they say, and debunk others. Every single source I use in this video will be linked in the description below. Without further ado, let us begin. As mentioned previously, the CHD was founded and is chaired by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. What one must understand is that Kennedy is not an expert in biology, or chemistry, or immunology, or even anything remotely to do with vaccines, fluoride or wireless communications. The guy's a lawyer, and as we all know, the relationship between lawyers and the truth is not necessarily a healthy one. This is a massive issue with the many experts who spout conspiracy theories online. They're rarely ever qualified in what they talk about, and it becomes apparent when you look at some of the things they say. An actual qualified expert would not make such claims because their experience in the field means they know it's wrong. He has consistently claimed that thimerosal is a component in vaccines that has contributed to the rise in neurodevelopmental disorders in young children. Thimerosal is a mercury-containing compound that was primarily used as a preservative in vaccines, as unlike other preservatives, it did not reduce the potency of the vaccine, which is undesirable, as obviously a weakened vaccine is going to be less effective. What is key to understand is that in the body, Thimerosal is metabolised into something called ethyl mercury, which is eliminated from the body much faster than elemental mercury, or even something called methyl mercury, which can be found in fish. Furthermore, as a precautionary measure, thimerosal was removed from childhood vaccines after the CDC requested it be removed in 1999, caving to the demands of the public. However, it still remains in flu vaccines, and those insisting thimerosal is a dangerous component of vaccinations because it contains a compound that contains a mercury atom clearly don't understand a basic principle of chemistry. A compound containing a specific element will not act in the same way it will in elemental form. We cannot determine how a compound will behave based on the elements inside it. We are carbon-based life forms. Diamonds are made of carbon. Nobody is going to argue we are made of diamond. Sodium is a highly reactive alkali metal, and I'm sure in science classrooms all over the world, sodium has been put in water and everyone's got to watch it fizz up. Chlorine is a highly toxic gas that was used as a chemical weapon in World War One. I'm going to give you 10 seconds to guess what these two elements combine to make. Table salt, sodium chloride, and as we all know, table salt is neither explosive nor poisonous. Thimerosal contains oxygen, sodium, sulfur, and mercury. People hear the word mercury and assume something must be deadly poisonous, but apply scrutiny to it and you realise the reality that compounds and elements are completely different. 
are looking at the elements that make up a compound tells you nothing about the properties of that compound. In arguing thimerosal is a dangerous component in vaccines, RFK Jr. demonstrates he doesn't understand this basic chemical principle. He even had the balls to offer $100,000 to anyone who could prove this wasn't the case, while ignoring a 1999 FDA review that did indeed that. The study here says our review revealed no evidence of harm caused by doses of thimerosal in vaccines except for local hypersensitivity reactions. However, some infants may be exposed to cumulative levels of mercury during the first six months of life that exceed EPA recommendations. Exposure of infants to mercury in vaccines can be reduced or eliminated by using products formulated without thimerosal as a preservative. For context, a hypersensitivity reaction is an exaggerated immune response to an allergen or pathogen. The study says delayed type hypersensitivity reactions from thimerosal exposure are well recognised. To translate this into English, it is saying it could not prove thimerosal in vaccines cause harm beyond allergic reactions, but some infants may have a build-up of mercury during the first six months of life that exceed recommendations. Obviously, the study I just mentioned is a couple of decades old, so we will look at a more recent one. The abstract of a review of the literature on the subject, published in 2010 by Stephen T. Schultz, states that this report reviews current literature regarding the association of the pharmaceutical preservative thimerosal and other mercury exposures with the risk for autism. The evidence presented here does not support a causal association between autism and mercury exposure from the preservative thimerosal. The risk for autism from other mercury exposures, such as from dental amalgam restorations or environmental mercury release into the atmosphere, is ambiguous. Since mercury is a known neurotoxin, more research should be done to ensure that mercury exposure from any source does not contribute to autism. He's done plenty of research relating to autism, and I will leave a link to an author profile of his in my list of sources. To once again translate, he's saying thimerosal has not been proven to be linked to autism, but other types of mercury exposures, such as from the environment or dental procedures, may cause autism and further research must be done to determine that. Vaccines have never contained elemental or methyl mercury. For RFK Jr. to be so confident that thimerosal causes autism that he offers 100k to anyone who can prove otherwise shows that he does not understand science, which is unsurprising because he isn't a scientist. I'm sure RFK Jr.'s response would be, on the one hand, the government is telling pregnant women which mercury-laced fish to avoid so they don't harm their fetuses, and on the other, the CDC supports injecting mercury-containing vaccines into pregnant women, infants and children. At face value, this seems like a perfectly reasonable statement to make, but as we have just investigated and proven using actual scientific literature, the statement lacks the necessary context. The issue is being oversimplified. Plenty of statements from people like RFK Jr. make sense to the average Joe, or even smarter people who just decide to take it at face value, but it's when you apply a bit more scepticism to what he's saying that it becomes apparent that he does not know what he's talking about. You see his lack of understanding again when he tried to claim Hank Aaron's death was caused by a vaccine. His logic was that he had died about two weeks after having the COVID vaccine, therefore it was caused by the COVID vaccination. The man was 86, bordering 87. What one must understand is that the majority of vaccinated people early on in the year were the old and vulnerable, some with underlying conditions. In order to say the vaccine killed him, one would have to be able to determine that without being vaccinated, he would not have died at that time. And with him being eight years over the average US life expectancy, you simply cannot determine that. Therefore, you cannot say with certainty that the vaccine was responsible for his death. In addition to that, Fulton County Medical Examiner Karen Sullivan told AFP in an email there was no information suggestive of an allergic or anaphylactic reaction to any substance which might be attributable to recent vaccine distribution. In addition, examination of Mr. Aaron's body did not suggest his death was due to any event other than that associated with his medical history. Based on the information provided by Mr. Aaron's family and physical examination of his body, it is my medical opinion that Mr. Aaron's death was not related to his recent vaccination for COVID-19. This is RFK once again showing that he doesn't understand science and now just basic logic that correlation does not equal causation. Let's now have a look at another member. Mary Holland is the president and the general counsel of the CHD, a general counsel being the main lawyer who gives legal advice to a company. Of course, it's handy that she's also an anti-vaccine advocate who insists that quote unquote accurate science on the dangers of vaccines to children are being suppressed all while ignoring the blatant flaws and conflicts of interest that plagues the studies that supposedly prove a link between vaccines and autism. 
I've had a very damning article written by her in 2018 titled A Thorough Analysis of the Case Against Dr. Andrew Wakefield, in which she claimed that Wakefield's original study from 1998 suggesting the MMR vaccine and autism could be linked was unfairly labelled as inaccurate and fraudulent, and that he was quote-unquote punished for upholding vaccine choice. In what may take the cake for the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard an anti-vaxxer say, she goes on to compare him to Nelson Mandela and says, before long, the world will likely recognise that it was Dr. Wakefield, not his detractors, who stood up for the practice of medicine and the pursuit of science. Dr. Wakefield remains an unbowed dissident in the face of a repressive medical and scientific establishment. I want to provide a bit of context surrounding Andrew Wakefield's original study in 1998 to show why it was retracted and why he's now a discredited former doctor. In the mid to late 90s, autism diagnoses were on the rise and parents understandably wanted to know why. They wanted a scapegoat and vaccines soon became said scapegoat. Personal injury lawyers swooped in, sniffing the massive pile of cash they could potentially get their hands on with all these lawsuits and Richard Barr looked to pursue a lawsuit against companies doing the MMR vaccine. As such, he would recruit Andrew Wakefield to conduct research on the matter with the aim of finding a new syndrome which would be the centrepiece of legal action on behalf of 1,600 families. The fact Wakefield had been recruited by a lawyer with an end goal of taking legal action against companies manufacturing their MMR vaccine and the fact they had both aimed to find evidence of something which should serve as the basis for a legal case before ever beginning research is a major conflict of interest. For those that don't understand this term, a conflict of interest is defined as a situation in which a person or organisation is involved in multiple interests, financial or otherwise, and serving one interest could involve working against another. An example of this would be a boss hiring their friends and family to be their most senior staff. To have a predetermined conclusion in mind before conducting a study is a major conflict of interest as it can lead to blatant tampering of evidence in order to reach your desired conclusion. Furthermore, Wakefield would charge £150 an hour for his work and was paid by Barr via the UK Legal Aid Fund designed to give poorer people access to legal justice. This would give Wakefield £435,000, then about US dollars for generic work alone, which was estimated to be about eight times higher than his annual salary and gave him a direct financial incentive to work with Barr and do so for as long as possible. Under Bars and Wakefield's direction, a small team of doctors and lawyers would work to prove the MMR vaccine caused a new syndrome. The big issue here is that he asserted the existence of this new syndrome that he dubbed autistic enterocolitis before he had ever conducted research to discover it. Once again, conflict of interest. Barr was not subtle about his plans. In a confidential letter, six months before the study was published, Barr would write in a confidential letter, I have mentioned to you before that the prime objective is to produce unassailable evidence in court so as to convince a court that these vaccines are dangerous. The study itself, published in The Lancet, has a few fatal flaws in it, the most obvious being that it only included 12 children, which is statistically negligible when trying to determine if two things are causally linked. Wakefield had also misrepresented his study, saying the sampling was consecutive, which means that everyone who is eligible for the study is selected, when it was actually selective, which comes down to the judgement of the researcher when choosing who to participate. Given he and Barr had their conclusions already in mind, it appears that he cherry-picked participants. This is given more weight given the 12 children's parents were actually clients of Barr. Two of the children were brothers, two attended the same doctor's office, and three were patients at another clinic. When you look at this study through a microscope, it is apparent that it is fatally flawed. So the question you may understandably be wondering is, how do we know all this? Well, in 2004, Brian Deere wrote a story alleging fraud on the part of Wakefield. What followed was a massive media frenzy, culminating in a 2010 British medical journal investigation which would result in the retraction of Wakefield's study. Anti-vaxxers often claim Deere has no evidence, something Holland's article also does, but the reality is his evidence was extensively vetted by editors, lawyers, producers and peer reviewers. He has gathered 16,000 documents and recordings and sat in court under the penalty of perjury, i.e. if he is found to be lying, he is breaking the law. His name has been cleared by libel specialists who investigate defamation. Holland's claim there is no basis for these allegations is objectively wrong and she is dipping into outright denial. She says, in his 2010 book, Callous Disregard, Dr. Wakefield shows Deere's allegations of fraud to be fabrications. 
It is a pretty mammoth task to fabricate audio recordings and documents that total up to 16,000 and have them so convincing that people who investigate defamation clear you and you are able to testify in court despite perjury laws. If Wakefield is so sure Deer's claims are fabrications, why can he not prove it? If he is able to materially prove Deer's claims are lies, Deer will face the legal consequences. Oh wait, Wakefield tried to sue Deer twice for defamation and twice the case was thrown out. Holland is showing her obvious bias by dismissing mountains of evidence admissible in the court of law against Wakefield, instead opting to take his word for it when he says it's fabricated. She also goes on to state, the GMC's conclusions and the Lancet's reliance on them appear unfounded. This is objectively wrong. If I accused Mrs. Holland here of being a shape-shifting lizard alien who collects the tears of children to quench her thirst, those claims would be unfounded. However, if I produce thousands of documents detailing this, that have been extensively verified by all sorts of people, and she cannot provide anything to the contrary, is that still unfounded? Okay, I, I want to clarify. I don't think she's a lizard alien who drinks child tears. Or at least I hope she isn't. The most damning of things she says is the CPR finds no evidence of Dr. Wakefield's scientific fraud. Now, what is the CPR, you may be wondering? Well, I'm sure it's what every anti-vaxxer watching this currently needs, but that's besides the point. The CPR, or the Centre of Personal Rights, is another organisation that preaches vaccine dangers and talks of a massive scientific cover-up. In what world does thousands of documents extensively vetted by a number of people, documents Wakefield nor Barr have ever been able to prove are actually fabricated, come second to an anti-vaccine group saying a doctor that happens to reaffirm their beliefs is not a fraud with no evidence? This is like if I was a policeman and a man is accused of being a serial rapist and the police chief, the top dog, appoints an investigator to look into the situation, collect witness testimonies, help coordinate forensic teams to find out anything to link him with the crime, etc. They don't find anything and stand in court and say they find no evidence of wrongdoing. Now, on the surface, that sounds completely fine, right? They searched and found nothing. Now, how about if the police chief and the investigator have been friends with the accused party for 28 years? All of a sudden, there's a conflict of interest there. The issue with the CPR and Wakefield here is that Holland is using an organisation that is known to be sceptical about the safety of vaccines, claiming a doctor who is also sceptical of the safety of vaccines did nothing wrong, despite evidence pointing completely the other way. One thing I want to add in here that I didn't know before is that Mary Holland is actually the co-founder of the CPR. So when she says the CPR finds no evidence of Wakefield's alleged scientific fraud, she is actually marking her own homework and using her organisation as a mouthpiece for her beliefs in an attempt to seem reliable, like some sort of independent organisation has found them to be fabrications. Even if this study had not been fraudulent, it has been outweighed by countless studies with larger and consecutive sample sizes. And later on, we will take a look at a few of those. Brian Hooker is another one of the people in this organisation, being on the board of directors. He is a bioengineer who also alleges the autism vaccine link is being covered up. In 2014, Hooker published a paper titled Measles, Mumps, Rubella Vaccination Timing and Autism Among Young African American Boys, a Reanalysis of CDC Data in the journal Translational Neurodegeneration. The paper alleges that a 2004 study co-authored by William Thompson, a CDC psychiatrist, showed a statistically significant correlation between autism and the MMR vaccine among African American boys. The journal would later retract the study, claiming there were conflicts of interest and concerns about the validity of the methods and statistical analyses. He was found to have been the scientific advisor for a group called Focus Autism, now known as Focus for Health. He was also in the middle of a legal case in which he was arguing his son had been given autism from a vaccine. These are clearly conflicts of interest. Unfortunately, what I'm about to discuss is where people's lack of scientific knowledge lets them down. People who share Hooker's opinions on vaccines will likely insist his study was unfairly struck down and is part of some sort of scientific cover-up. But what I'm about to show you is that this study, and studies that get struck down that insist vaccines and autism are linked, are done so for good reason. For context, the original study from 2004 was done by De Stefano et al. Evaluating 624 children with autism aged between 3 and 10 and matched each child with as similar a control as they could get, with there being 1,824 controls. 
Most of the children had been vaccinated between 12 and 17 months of age in accordance with recommendations. The claim is that the original study discarded data that couldn't be linked to a birth certificate to hide the increased risk for African American boys, but this is false. To clarify, the subjects were split into two groups, those who could be linked to a Georgia birth certificate and those who could not. A Georgia birth certificate provided additional information such as the birth weight, the mother's age, etc, etc. These are other risk factors for autism and it is key to account for these factors. The problem with the claim is that both groups contained African Americans and the non-birth certificate group actually contained less of them. The birth certificate group contained 37.9% African Americans to the non-birth certificates 32.2%. And even after all this, no data was actually excluded. Two analyses were done, one that ignored the birth certificate data and looked at the subject as a whole, and a separate analysis for the birth certificate group using the extra information available, and the two analyses were in agreement. The claims that the CDC tossed the data they didn't like just doesn't add up here. Hooker's 2014 analysis has a few flaws in it. One is that the subjects are split into two groups, those who are African American and those who are not. Why did he do this? As we've established, the 2004 study did not evaluate race. It wasn't focused on race, so the decision to split the subject like that in the reanalysis seems a bit strange. Why not split them into separate ethnicities like African American, Hispanic, white, etc? It seems strange to split people up based on them being or not being of one specific ethnicity. Hooker attempted to look for an association between vaccination, time, gender and the risk of autism within each of these groups. Most of the data is insignificant, besides two subgroups. African American boys vaccinated between 18 and 23 months carry a relative risk of 1.73, and those vaccinated between 24 and 35 months carry a relative risk of 3.36, which is where the claims of 340% increased risk comes from. To clarify, a relative risk of 1 means there is no change in risk if someone is or isn't exposed to something. The problem here is that relative risk is used for cohort studies, not a case control study, as this is. To clarify, a cohort study is a long-term study where one group is exposed to something and the other group isn't, and it's used to determine if being exposed to that something can cause disease for, you know, what it does to that person, the frequency of disease, etc, etc. Whereas a case control study takes two groups that are virtually identical in every way, except one has a disease and one doesn't, and it uses historical data, interviews, etc, etc, to try and determine if they were exposed to something. Whereas the cohort study exposes someone to something to determine if they get the disease, the case control study takes someone who already has the disease to try and determine if they were exposed to something. The issue here is that relative risk is a metric in cohort studies, and the data is of a case control study. What this suggests is that Brian Hooker has absolutely no clue what he's doing. The biggest problem here is that Hooker slices and dices the data to get his results. 70% of the subjects were vaccinated between 12 and 17 months, according to CDC recommendations. So Hooker is only working with 30% of the subjects at this stage. Then factor in that only 7% of subjects were vaccinated at the time frames Hooker says are significant. Then factor in that Hooker is only dealing with African Americans, which made up only 37% of the entire sample, who were male, who made up 80% of the entire sample. So that 7% figure is further reduced. So after so many reductions, what you have is a super specific subsample. So this massively increased risk is likely based on a tiny number of cases. When you slice and dice data in such a way, you're inevitably going to start noticing patterns that aren't really there. Hooker also wrote, it was found that there was a higher proportion of low birth weight African Americans compared to the entire cohort. Well, first of all, it's not a cohort. It's a case control study that you've taken the data from and decided to reanalyze. The second problem is that what we have here is a super specific tiny subsample in which a known risk factor for autism is more common in comparison to the entire sample. Because of this, it is likely that the relative risk of 3.36 is an overestimate as Hooker failed to control for low birth weight. Hooker's study falls victim to what is known as the Texas sharpshooter fallacy, where differences in data are ignored and similarities are exaggerated. Here, Hooker focuses in on a very specific subsample, fails to account for other risk factors, and then overstates the risk, while ignoring the fact that the rest of the sample 
which was the overwhelming majority of the sample, found nothing that was of any significance. The data he didn't like was ignored, and he hyperfixated on a very specific group. The name Texas Sharpshooter Fallacy comes from the joke about a Texan shooting the side of a barn and drawing targets around the closest cluster of shots to make it look like he's a sharpshooter. Now, knowing all this, it is now painfully obvious that Hooker's study was not struck down because the government overlords found it inconvenient to them, but because there were genuine issues with the study that made it unreliable. One of them claimed thimerosal causes autism, despite evidence saying otherwise, and showed he does not understand correlation, does not equal causation. Another one used an anti-vax company she co-founded, saying an anti-vax doctor isn't a fraud, as proof over the thousands of verified documents that said doctor has not been able to materially approve our fabrications. And one claims vaccines cause autism, was paid by an anti-vax group he happened to be a board member of to attempt to prove it, and attempted to portray the CDC as committing scientific fraud. I'd like to think the more rational people watching this, who are a bit more tied to reality, who maybe have just sat on the fence and aren't quite sure of the safety of vaccines, which ultimately is a perfectly rational fear to have, especially when it's dealing with your kids, hopefully they will now see that these people are not to be trusted. Because ultimately my end goal is to just give people who are on the fence, who aren't quite sure of what is not isn't real, just give them, them a bit of information to see that these people who shout from the rooftops about our global autism cover-up aren't reliable sources of information. Those that are deeply entrenched in their beliefs who watch this will inevitably go into denial and bury their head in the sand at best. At worst, they will arrogantly leave comments about how dumb I am. Those people are of no interest to me because I'm never going to help them, am I? Let's be honest. They are so far gone and so entrenched in their beliefs that no matter how many arguments you present them with, they won't accept it. It has become a matter of faith, not evidence for them. However, I think it's time to take a look at some of the evidence the website itself gives for its claims. One of the things that makes the CHD stand out amongst other anti-vaccine groups and flavours of conspiracy is that it attempts to appear scientific by using actual studies and papers. This largely contributes to its status as one of the most dangerous anti-vaccine groups, as it gives it an air of reliability, as if science is somehow on their side. In reality, anybody with enough scientific knowledge can easily scrutinise the studies they provide and the people who authored them, and find out they're really not as reliable as they'd like to make out. One of the key aspects of scientific research is being able to replicate your results. Anybody who did even a basic experiment in science class had to repeat the experiment for the sake of accuracy to ensure that your results are actually reliable. If you can produce a study that links MMR vaccines to autism without being connected to anti-vaccine groups, or making scientific errors for that matter, but your results cannot be replicated by subsequent studies all around the world, then your findings are not going to be seen as accurate. This is the issue with the argument made by the CHD that data is being somehow suppressed and that the link between vaccines and developmental problems in children is being covered up. The world of science is not run by a committee where every single study is funneled through a few guys in a room who chuck your findings in a paper shredder if they don't like it. Science is autonomous. There are scientific communities in virtually every country on earth all conducting various kinds of research and there are an estimated 7 million scientists. If you conduct scientific research and it is peer-reviewed and it's checked and verified, then you can publish it in a scientific journal. The idea from this corner of the internet that the MMR autism link is being suppressed just doesn't hold water because their studies were published in reputable journals. Wakefield's study was published in The Lancet, considered one of the best-known medical journals, and Hooker's was published in Translational Neurodegeneration. It was only when the scientific flaws and conflicts of interest were revealed that these studies were retracted. Those that are unable to accept that this is the case and instead scream conspiracy are ultimately in denial and they have an inflated sense of their own competence and have biases that are clouding their judgment. With all that being said, let's take a look at a few studies provided by the CHD. First of all, this one is authored by a bunch of unreliable people. First of all, we will take a look at Mark R. Gaia. Mark Gaia is a liar and a manipulator. You may be wondering, well, how the hell do we know this? Since 2011, every state in which he was licensed to practice medicine in revoked it after concerns over his autism treatments and him claiming he is a board-certified geneticist and epidemiologist when he is not. 
Furthermore, the Institutional Review Board that Gaia claimed had approved his experiments involving autistic children contained his son, wife, a business partner, and a lawyer seeking legal action against vaccines, which is a serious conflict of interest. Think of an IRB as an ethics board who review what you plan to do for the study and the people in it to determine if it is ethical or not. The IRB did not meet the standards of federal and state law. His work in the court of law as an expert witness has been called into question, with his testimony is being labelled as intellectually dishonest, unreliable and wholly unqualified. In what should instantly discredit this entire document, he or his son authored or co-authored a total of 29 studies provided in this document. For those watching this video who want to talk about quote-unquote Nuremberg trials and claim the current COVID-19 vaccines are unethical, do you know what is unethical? Having to fill an ethics board with family and business associates just to get clearance to work with autistic children on a study. There is a reason we have ethics boards to protect participants in the study, which is especially necessary when those participants happen to be autistic children. I find it embarrassing that an organisation that calls themselves the Children's Health Defence and advocates for the protection of young children is willing to use the work of a man who had to use nepotism to gain ethical clearance to do a study with children. Some of that work being discredited by far more intelligent people than me. The study I initially showed has a few flaws, a few of which I will now point out. The study from 2003 relies on the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS, which has skyrocketed in terms of public interest during the pandemic. What those who like to use it as some sort of proof that COVID-19 vaccines are dangerous forget or fail to mention is that it has a few caveats. It is an open source system, which means anyone can report an adverse effect. While adverse effects reported may actually be accurate, the VAERS will inevitably contain data that is coincidental, or a simple error. The limits of the VAERS is that you will have unverified reports and incomplete reporting as not everybody suffering from an adverse event will report it and no data on those who were vaccinated but had no adverse effects so your data is not really a true reflection of reality. The purpose of the system is to see adverse effects being reported to see if patterns are developing so further research can be done. It's good for generating hypotheses for them to be studied in a more controlled manner, but using VAERS data in your research makes it unreliable, as this paper is, as it ignores the caveats the VAERS has. Any credible scientist or statistician knows the weaknesses of the system, and people using it as proof are ultimately armchair scientists who think they understand what is going on better than they actually do. The study also fails to mention how thimerosal exposure was calculated, this is a problem because much of the data needed to calculate mercury exposure is not available in VAERS reports. And finally, the study claims it is indeed possible that children in the US in 2003 may be exposed to levels of mercury from thimerosal exposure in their childhood vaccinations that are at a higher level than any time in the past. This just doesn't add up. As, like I went through earlier, thimerosal was ordered to be removed from infant vaccines in 1999 and were done so soon afterwards. By 2003, thimerosal was not contained in most childhood vaccinations, so the idea that they are exposed to more in 2003 than at any point in the past is just quite simply incorrect. The next one is this, and like the others, at face value it can seem reliable, but when you look into who conducts these studies, it becomes blatantly apparent that any scientific research they conduct is not reliable. One of the authors of this one is Jeff Bradstreet, a doctor, preacher and practitioner of homeopathy, an extensively debunked pseudoscience that claims that a substance that causes symptoms of a disease in healthy people can cure similar symptoms in sick people, or like cures like. However, our extensive understanding of the germ theory of disease completely contradicts and disproves homeopathy and anyone who practices it is either deluded or a quack looking to rip people off. Unfortunately, Bradstreet died in 2015 in controversial circumstances, being found dead via gunshot wound to the chest after the FDA had raided his medical office. At face value, this sounds quite shady, but the FDA had investigated him after a social media post linked him to an unlicensed medical factory that was shut down for producing potentially contaminated vials of a supposed wonder cure called GCMAF. 
GC Math was fired into the stratosphere of alt health when an alternate health and conspiracy publication, Natural News, claimed a particular cure named GC Math, short for GC protein derived macrophage activating factor, which is a chemically altered form of a natural protein that allegedly stimulates the activity of a specific kind of white blood cell, has the potential to be a universal cure for cancer. GCMAF is also believed to be capable of treating and reversing autism, HRV, liver slash kidney disease and diabetes. Rumour has it that GCMAF has the potential to be a cure for even more diseases such as herpes as well. However, no scientific evidence has ever been provided to prove the efficacy of this miracle cure, with most of what was published in reputable journals being retracted. In 2017, an expose revealed the inventor and champion of this miracle cure, one Dr. Nobuto Yamamoto, was found to be falsifying clinical trials in order to pass it off as a miracle cure. On the day of Bradstreet's death, it was reported that five patients had died receiving this treatment at a clinic linked to Bradstreet. After his death in 2015, many claimed it was a result of foul play and private investigators were hired to find out, and six years later, we've heard nothing. Police suspect a suicide and those disputing it have nothing to go on but gut feeling given private investigators haven't been able to cough anything up in six years. Maybe there was foul play involved but until someone can cough up the goods, the claims that he was killed are based only on opinion. I'm not going to look at any specific study for this point but address the whole document. It mentions the word thimerosal a total of 1434 times in its attempts to ultimately suggest it plays a part in the development of autism. The problem with this hypothesis is that it would be quite apparent by now, not only through science, but by simple observation. Logically, if thimerosal causes autism, the more people who are exposed to it, the more people who will get autism. Now, this makes sense, right? However, if fewer people are exposed to thimerosal, fewer people will get autism. This isn't occurring. In reality, the number of autism diagnoses is rising. People use this fact to suggest something is causing the rise, but this simply isn't an effective way of measuring such a thing, as it doesn't take into account things like population growth. The way you measure it is by looking at the rate of autism diagnoses. This is a graph constructed using CDC data that shows the prevalence of autism in the US population. In 1970, the rate was 1 in 10,000. In 1995, the rate was 1 in 1,000. In 2020, it was 1 in 59. Sounds alarming, right? Let's give some context to these figures though. In 1987, the criteria for an autism diagnosis was expanded so that one could be diagnosed if signs appeared after 30 months of age. Children also had to meet 8 of the 16 criteria as opposed to having to meet all of the previous 6 criteria. These changes likely led to an increase in the number of autism diagnoses. Then in 1991, children who had an autism diagnosis were entitled to special education services, so more parents went to get their child evaluated to see if they had autism. In 1994, the autism diagnosis criteria was further broadened as as Burgess syndrome was added to the mild end of the spectrum. In 2013, autism, Asperger's and pervasive developmental disorders not otherwise specified were collapsed into a single diagnosis. The criteria for diagnosis are dependent on a book called the DSM, or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, and numerous editions have been released over the years that make changes to various criteria for a diagnosis. There's also the fact that before the 80s, people diagnosed with autism were institutionalised, so the general public had very little awareness of the condition. Increased awareness of autism and its effects on people mean parents are more likely to have their child evaluated, and schools are more likely to take notice of children showing signs. Since 2006, it's been recommended that all children are evaluated for autism during a routine paediatrics visit between 18 and 24 months of age. This means that cases of autism that may have slipped under the radar didn't. These changes in how we diagnose autism and the increased awareness is a pretty clear explanation for its exponential increase in prevalence. Despite this, if thimerosal is a factor in the development of autism, would you not expect there to have been a decrease in the rate of autism diagnoses after the 1999 FDA removal? If you look at this graph, you see that after 1999, the rate of autism diagnosis actually increases. This is because in 2000, the CDC began tracking its prevalence, so of course there was a massive spike upwards as it was being tracked more closely. If thimerosal was a genuine factor in the development of autism, its removal should have had a noticeable effect on autism's prevalence. Let me give you an example. In England and Wales, the contraceptions per 1,000 women aged between 15 and 17 fell from 41.6 in 2007 to 18.9 in 2016. How, in nine years, did the contraception rate fall by over half?
First of all, it had been falling since the early 2000s, and the decrease is largely due to people being in education longer, increased education on sexual health, reliable contraception, and the social stigma. Teenage pregnancies are looked down upon these days, so teenage girls are more careful nowadays. So you may be wondering, how on earth does this tie into the autism point? The point is, is that what this shows is that by addressing the risk factors for something, you will see a decrease in its prevalence. A common response I expect here is that, oh, the numbers are too high, there's no way this is just down to better egg diagnoses. So, to respond to that, let's do a little thought experiment. Let's say I work at an SDI clinic, and people come in asking for a HIV test. Let's say that for every 40 people who ask for a HIV test, I only give one person a test. Then I record all the positive HIV cases in my clinic for that year. The following year, I give out two tests for every 40 people that ask for one. When I record the positive cases for that year, what I will most likely find is an increase in the positive HIV cases because I've tested more people. So when we reach the end, where over the course of 40 years I've increased the number of tests given out per 40 by one every year, when you plot those results on a graph, you will see a steady increase. Year on year, the number of reported positive HIV cases at my clinic rises. The problem here is that on a graph, it gives off the illusion that HIV is spreading more and more over time, when in reality it's merely that we've increased the number of tests over time. There's no physical change in the spread of HIV. Now apply this logic to the rise in autism diagnoses. With more people being evaluated, more societal awareness of autism and its signs, and definitions that account for autism's wide range of effects on people, more people are being diagnosed with autism. When plotted on a graph, it gives the illusion of autism occurring in more people over time, when it is actually being recognised in more people over time. I go to my overall point directed at people who claim thimerosal in vaccines causes autism. Why didn't its removal have an impact on the rate of autism diagnoses? So in the studies we've taken a look at, one, or should I say 28, was authored by a literal fraud who dodged ethics rules when dealing with autistic kids, and a man who sold untested and unapproved cures for financial gain, and at least according to the current information, committed suicide after the FDA raided his medical office. Hardly the most damning evidence for their claims, is it? I made this video because not everybody will be able to point out the flaws in their science as I have, and because of that, they will be inclined to believe it. The CHD need to use evidence from people who aren't awful human beings if they want to be taken seriously. To kill off any fears those still sitting on this fence may have, allow me to present a review from 2009 called Vaccines and Autism, a tale of shifting hypotheses that summarises the findings of various other studies that show why the scientific consensus is that vaccines do not cause autism. Although child vaccination rates remain high, some parental concern persists that vaccines might cause autism. Three specific hypotheses have been proposed. One, the combination measles mumps rubella vaccine causes autism by damaging the intestinal lining, which allows the entrance of encephalophathic proteins. Two, thimerosal, an ethyl mercury containing preservative in some vaccines, is toxic to the central nervous system. And three, the simultaneous administration of multiple vaccines overwhelms or weakens the immune system. We will discuss the genesis of each of these theories and review the relevant epidemiological evidence. A worldwide increase in the rate of autism diagnoses, likely driven by broadened diagnostic criteria and increased awareness, has fueled concerns that an environmental exposure, like vaccines, might cause autism. Theories for this putative association has centred on the measles mumps rubella vaccine, thimerosal, and a large number of vaccines currently administered. However, both epidemiological and biological studies fail to support these claims. Although no data supporting an association between MMR vaccine and autism existed and a plausible biological mechanism was lacking, several epidemiological studies were performed to address parental fears created by the publication of Wakefield et al. Fortunately, several features of large-scale vaccination programs allowed for excellent descriptive and observational studies, specifically large numbers of subjects which generated substantial statistical power, high-quality vaccination records which provided reliable historical data, multinational use of similar vaccine constituents and schedules, electronic medical records which facilitated accurate analysis of outcome data, and the relatively recent introduction of MMR vaccine in some countries which has allowed for before and after comparisons. Researchers in several countries perform ecological studies that address the question of whether MMR vaccines cause autism. Such analyses employ large databases that compare vaccination rates with autism diagnoses at the population level. 
In the United Kingdom, researchers evaluated 498 autistic children born from 1979 through 1992 who were identified by computerised health records from eight health districts. Although a trend towards increasing autism diagnosis by year of birth was confirmed, no change in the rates of autism diagnosis after the 1987 introduction of MMR vaccine was observed. Further, MMR vaccination rates of autistic children were similar to those of the entire study population. Also, investigators did not observe a clustering of autism diagnoses relative to the time that children received MMR vaccine, nor did they observe a difference in age of autism diagnosis between those vaccinated and not vaccinated, or between those vaccinated before or after 18 months of age. These authors also found no differences in autism rates among vaccinated and unvaccinated children when they extended their analysis to include a longer time after MMR exposure or a second dose of MMR. Also in the United Kingdom, researchers performed a time trend analysis using the General Practice Research Database, a high quality, extensively validated electronic medical record with virtually complete vaccination data. More than 3 million person years of observation during 1988 to 1999 confirmed an increase in autism diagnoses despite stable MMR vaccination rates. In California, researchers compared year-specific MMR vaccination rates of kindergarten students with the yearly autism caseload of the California Department of Developmental Services during 1980 to 1994. As was observed in the United Kingdom, the increase in the number of autism diagnoses did not correlate with MMR vaccination rates. In Canada, researchers estimated the prevalence of pervasive developmental disorder with respect to MMR vaccination in 27,749 children from 55 schools in Quebec. Autism rates increased coincident with a decrease in MMR vaccination rates. The results were unchanged when both exposure and outcome definitions varied, including a strict diagnosis of autism. Thimerosal, 50% mercury by weight, is an antibacterial compound that has been used effectively in multi-dose vaccine preparations for over 50 years. Thimerosal is not contained in live virus vaccines such as MMR. In 1997, the US Food and Drug Administration Modernization Act mandated identification and quantification of mercury in all food and drugs. Two years later, the US FDA found that children might be receiving as much as 187.5 micrograms of mercury within the first six months of life. Despite the absence of data suggesting harm from quantities of ethyl mercury contained in vaccines, in 1999 the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Public Health Service recommended the immediate removal of mercury from all vaccines given to young infants. Widespread and predictable misinterpretation of the Conservative Precautionary Directive, coupled with a public already concerned by a proposed but unsubstantiated link between vaccination and autism, understandably provoked concern among parents which led to the birth of several anti-mercury advocacy groups. However, because the signs and symptoms of autism are clearly distinct from those of mercury poisoning, concern about mercury as a cause of autism were, similar to those with MMR vaccine, biologically implausible. Children with mercury poisoning show characteristic motor, speech, sensory, psychiatric, visual and head circumference changes that are either fundamentally different from those or absent in children with autism. Consistent with this, a study performed by scientists at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention years later showed that mercury in vaccines did not cause even subtle signs or symptoms of mercury poisoning. Four cohort studies that examined thimerosal exposure and autism have been performed as follows. In Denmark, researchers examined more than 1,200 children with autism that were identified during 1990 and 1996, which comprised of about 3 million person years. They found that the risk of autism did not differ between children vaccinated with thimerosal-containing vaccines and those vaccinated with thimerosal-free vaccines, or between children who received greater or lower quantities of thimerosal. They also found that the rates of autism increased after the removal of thimerosal of all vaccines. In the United States, using the Vaccine Safety Data Link, researchers at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention examined 140,887 US children born between 1991 and 1999, including more than 200 children with autism. The researchers found no relationship between receipt of thimerosal-containing vaccines and autism. In England, researchers prospectively followed 12,810 children for whom they had complete vaccination records who were born between 1991 and 1992, and they found no relationship between early thimerosal exposure and deleterious neurological or psychological outcomes. In the United Kingdom, researchers evaluated the vaccination records of 100,572 children born between 1988 and 1997 using the General Practice Research Database, 104 of whom were affected with autism. No relationship between thimerosal exposure and autism diagnosis was observed.
When studies of MMR vaccine in thimerosal containing vaccines failed to show an association with autism, alternative theories emerged. The most prominent theory suggests that the simultaneous administration of multiple vaccines overwhelms or weakens the immune system and creates an interaction with the nervous system that triggers autism in a susceptible host. This theory was recently popularised in the wake of a concession by the Vaccine Industry Compensation Programme with regard to the case of a nine-year-old girl with a mitochondrial enzyme deficiency whose encephalopathy, which included features of autism spectrum disorder, was judged to have worsened following the receipt of multiple vaccines at age 19 months. Despite reassurances by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that the Vaccine Industry Compensation Programme's action should not be interpreted as scientific evidence that vaccines cause autism, many in the lay press and the public have not been reassured. The notion that children might be receiving too many vaccines too soon and that these vaccines either overwhelm an immature immune system or generate a pathologic autism-inducing autoimmune response is flawed for several reasons. Vaccines do not overwhelm the immune system. Although the infant immune system is relatively naive, it is immediately capable of generating a vast array of protective responses. Even conservative estimates predict the capacity to respond to thousands of vaccines simultaneously. Consistent with this theoretical exercise, combinations of vaccines induce immune responses comparable to those given individually. Also, although the number of recommended childhood vaccines has increased during the past 30 years, with advances in protein chemistry and recombinant DNA technology, the immunologic load has actually decreased. The 14 vaccines given today contain less than 200 bacterial and viral proteins, or polysaccharides, compared with more than 3,000 of these immunological components in the seven vaccines administered in 1980. Further, vaccines represent a minute fraction of what a child's immune system routinely navigates. The average child is infected with four to six viruses per year. The immune response elicited from the vast antigen exposure of unattenuated viral replication supersedes that of even multiple simultaneous vaccines. Multiple vaccinations do not weaken the immune system. Vaccinated and unvaccinated children do not differ in their susceptibility to infections not prevented by vaccines. In other words, vaccination does not suppress the immune system in a clinically relevant manner. However, infections with some vaccine-preventable diseases predispose children to severe invasive infections with other pathogens. Therefore, the available data suggests that vaccines do not weaken the immune system. Autism is not an immune-mediated disease. Unlike autoimmune diseases such as multiple sclerosis, there is no evidence of immune activation or inflammatory lesions in the CNS of people with autism. In fact, current data suggests that genetic variation in neuronal circuitry that affects synaptic development might in part account for autistic behaviour. Thus, speculation that an exaggerated or inappropriate immune response to vaccination precipitates autism is at variance with current scientific data that address the pathogenesis of autism. No studies have compared the incidence of autism in vaccinated, unvaccinated or alternatively vaccinated children, i.e. schedules that spread out vaccines, avoid combination vaccines or include only select vaccines. These studies would be difficult to perform because of the likely differences among these three groups in healthcare seeking behaviour and the ethics of experimentally studying children who have not received vaccines. 20 epidemiologic studies have shown that neither thimerosal nor MMR vaccine causes autism. These studies have been performed in several countries by many different investigators who have employed a multitude of epidemiologic and statistical methods. The large size of the studied populations have afforded a level of statistical power sufficient to detect even rare associations. These studies, in concert with the biological implausibility that vaccines overwhelm a child's immune system, have effectively dismissed the notion that vaccines cause autism. Further studies on the cause or causes of autism should focus on more promising leads. The link to this review will be in the description as it goes into far more detail in proving these three hypotheses wrong. For the sake of time, I've summed it up, but the point still stands. The bottom line is that extensive scientific research has never been able to find a link between vaccines and autism. The question you may be wondering is, well, why? Why would they do this? What is the aim, the purpose, whatever? And we can only really speculate on that. Some will say that this is a clear grift where medical professionals are taking advantage of parents' fears about autism to give them unapproved treatments that they will profit from. People like RFK Jr. have written books about this and he recently released one on Dr. Fauci, which personally to me seems like an attempt to make a quick buck on the growing anti-Fauci trend, justified or not. 
the CHD sells merch and has a members only section which you have to fork out $10 for and it doesn't really make sense to me that a fight the good fight non-profit that wants to spread the word has certain information locked behind a paywall. I imagine there are better ways to make money than that and it sort of tarnishes the way they want to be perceived. Now non-profits can't be set up with the sole aim of generating profit, they have to serve the public in some way but employees can still be paid a salary for their work. RFK will earn a salary, he will get profits from book sales, he will make money speaking at events as they often charge, and he has been known to profit from affiliate links with other anti-vaccine gurus, so let's not pretend like he's living on pocket change here. A massive issue I find with conspiracy theories is often the infallibility of them. No matter how many points you debunk or how many people you show shouldn't be trusted, it's almost like the penny never drops in their mind, they'll always give another argument which is often a fallacious one or one based on bad or incorrect information. And what it shows is that we as a species are really good at forming opinions and when we hold on to opinions really tightly and get flooded with information we think proves us right, it's really hard to convince us that we are actually wrong. If you supported the CHD before watching this and you are still trying to think up arguments as to why you're right, you need to think, if this video had been proving the government to be untrustworthy and incorrect, would you still be so reluctant to believe it? You have to challenge your confirmation bias. At the end of the day, the CHD is dangerous because it helps increase vaccine hesitancy, which is a public health crisis. If you choose to eat three Big Macs a day, it's only your health you're endangering. By refusing vaccines based on misinformation, viruses are more likely to spread, which puts the lives of those who cannot get vaccinated, either because they're too young or immunocompromised, at risk. I've heard people say, well it's only my family that matter, you know, how my actions affect others is of no concern to me, but I find that such a callous way of living life. To people saying this, if a loved one of yours died from a drink driving accident and the guy who did it stood up in court and said only people I worry about is my family and my family's life, why should I, I worry about other people I don't know, you know, I was just having a bit of fun. Would you not be mortified to hear someone so lacking in empathy at the fact that they killed your loved one? It's the same for people who disregard herd immunity because, you know, other people don't matter to me, it's just me and my family. Next time you argue herd immunity doesn't matter because you only look out for people you care about, realise that that's someone's son or daughter there. Just because you don't care for them because they're not friends or family or you don't really know them doesn't mean other people don't. The CHD misleads by using fallacious arguments, hiring people who are not trusted scientists and using literature from people who are also untrustworthy untrustworthy, I said that like I was a German then. It's agenda ridden because the CHD ignores these obvious red flags, i.e. Gaia being a literal fraud who lied about his credentials, and they just soldier on either because they make money out of it or because they're deluded and they want to continue pushing the anti-vax agenda because they actually believe in it. In life, we look at risks versus benefits. Vaccines bring far more benefit than risk. The benefits, you ask? Eliminating smallpox, which our world in data reports killed 200 million people in the 20th century alone. Smallpox had a 30% death rate. Put smallpox in a classroom of 30 kids, which is, you know, your average classroom size, at least in this country, and on average, nine will die and more will be left with horrific long-term damage. Things like measles and polio, which used to terrify parents, are easily manageable these days, thanks to the power of vaccines. Take them away and these will come back. Which we are seeing happening now because of this growing anti-vaccine rhetoric. Things like measles are coming back. Compare this to the risks. Yes, some people die from vaccines and it is an unfortunate tragedy, but the numbers of them are so negligible compared to the amount of lives they will have saved throughout history. If they choose to ignore this, they clearly don't care about net benefits. Look at cars, for example. The WHO estimates that 1.35 million people die every year due to car accidents, yet we haven't abandoned cars because we understand that they bring far more benefits to society than detriments. Does that mean we stay ignorant and ignore the potential dangers? No, it doesn't. In the same way cars now have airbags and countries have speed limits and seatbelt laws, vaccine trials are designed to find adverse effects. If the small number of deaths from vaccines make you not want to have your child vaccinated, then I hope the significantly higher number of deaths on the road means you never drive with your child in the car. 
to those with their fingers at the readies who call me a government shill or say my sources are biased, uh, at, at least attempt to prove it before leaving a comment. If you can't find evidence of that, then hopefully you can start moving out of denial and anger and into bargaining. My sources go into far more detail than I ever could have in this video, so no matter what side you want, I urge you to check them below. I've summed them up for the sake of time. I mean, I mean, this video is an hour long. Hopefully, I've brought those on the fence back to the rational and science-supported side. I'd like to see the CHD respond, but I don't expect it. Uh, the, the most likely CHD response is a uh, slander lawsuit, but we move. Next time, I'm going to be focusing on a few key individuals who help perpetuate COVID misinformation. But if you have any ideas for videos after that, such as specific theories, concepts or individuals you want to me to take a look at, I'll be happy to consider it. But those videos are going to take a while. Like I said earlier, this video has been in the making since April. To those who somehow made it to the end, hopefully you've enjoyed this more serious and informative video and I'll see you all next time.